Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, really a pleasure to be part of this uh, conference. Uh, just a delight to be part of this tremendous speaking panel and I'm uh, delighted to be invited. So this is um, a really great topic. I think, uh, fortunately, the, the answer's already been kind of given to you this morning. I think you've seen just imaging after imaging after imaging be so important in the management of how we take care of complex coronary disease patients with um, both IVUS and OCT being shown today. So we'll get into it. Um, these are my disclosures. And so what is the role of intravascular imaging in PCI? I think we can kind of bring this into multiple different bins. Um, and I, there's a lot of discussion about IVUS or OCT. The short answer is either. In terms of what we can do, um, we are clearly focused in on optimizing um, stent placement with PCI. And that's really the main focus is intraprocedural use. There are other important applications, uh, including understanding mechanisms of ACS, and then really other parts of aiding in complex PCI, and we'll show some of these cases. For stent placement, as you've seen, we really need to understand size. Our eyes just are insufficient for angiography, both for diameter and length. Calcium, clearly underestimated by fluoroscopy. Plaque burden, we know that ending stents in large areas of plaque lead to inferior outcomes. We cannot see this when we only look at the lumen. We need to look at the wall. And then during PCI, we um, need to understand if there's significant edge dissections or significant malapposition. For acute coronary syndromes, what we're interested in understanding, sometimes it's not always clear to find out what the culprit lesion was when we have multivessel disease in non-STEMI patients. Sometimes it will be important to understand, especially as you saw earlier, the potential for erosion to be managed diff uh, differently than plaque rupture. Um, we need to understand some of these mechanisms. Um, OCT is really the best for looking at the surface of the lesion due to its high resolution. And then mechanisms, sometimes we're gonna find that what we thought was a stenosis might actually be due to hematoma and um, uh, underlies SCAD uh, mediology. In terms of aiding in complex PCI, some of the really important things that are important in, in more complex situations to understand if one is in the true or false lumen, whether or not there is hematoma, um, induced by the work that we are doing. We can resolve ambiguity, particularly proximal cap ambiguity in the setting of total occlusion intervention. And then for more advanced techniques, we can do real-time wiring using IVIS. So what is the baseline uh, real uh, motivation for this is, is that we are still limited by restenosis. Can't be said enough. Um, we know we do a fantastic job this morning. We saw incredible cases, but despite the phenomenal acute results, we still have significant MACE rates in year one and then 2% per year, every year thereafter, even in the modern DES era. So restenosis is not a benign illness. It leads to hospitalization, acute coronary syndromes, re-intervention, brachytherapy, and bypass. We can reduce restenosis. This is our best technique for reducing restenosis is doing a great job at the time of PCI. Optimizing stent expansion, covering significant dissections, and again, avoiding black burden areas that are high when we place our stents. This is where imaging can really provide an advantage. So here's the clinical data, just to be brief. We have um, multiple randomized trials, um, left main, um, CTO, long lesions, all comers, all showing that we have about a 50% reduction in TLR. We don't need a next generation stent before we actually start to apply imaging. We can get a TLR reduction of 50%. And so this is incredibly helpful at the point of care to consider this. And I think you saw it today being used really efficiently. You don't always have to have a separate advisor um, to help you um, analyze the images. There's now a lot of automation, particularly in the OCT era. This will happen further with IVIS as well. You know, we need to know where to place that stent, what the stent length is, do we need to prepare the vessel further. These are fast, easy things to actually address as soon as you get used to imaging in your workflow. Um, and so again, going back to the question of is it IVUS or OCT, I think for mechanisms of ACS, OCT is superior to look at the lumen um, and certain aspects of mechanisms of restenosis and stent thrombosis. Um, but for in general, for stent expansion, PCI clinical outcomes, there really is no difference. This is a recent meta-analysis published in CCI uh, based on uh, about seven randomized trials that have looked at um, IVUS and OCT comparisons. And there really is no difference, maybe even slight trends towards OCT. We're going to learn about this in the future with Illumium 4, Octavis, and October um, will be our next set of randomized trials that really inform this. 
and again, we'll hopefully provide class one indications um, for imaging and the guidelines. So the consensus imaging uh, guidelines, just important to show before we show a few case examples uh, in complex PCI, is that the minimum stent area can be quantified um, very quickly um, and uh, by IVUS and OCT, 5.5 for IVUS, greater than 4.5 for OCT, and in a more, uh, slightly more complicated formula to look at the overall extent expansion by dividing the surface area by the reference luminal area, and that is a target of greater than 80%. Other important aspects is to avoid plaque burden landing um, in areas that are less than 50%. Um, avoid di significant dissections or cover them when they are there. Um, tissue prolapse, which is probably, again, better seen by OCT due to its surface resolution, um, can try to be avoided. Sometimes it will require covering with a second stent when extensive. And then avoiding severe malapposition greater than 400 microns and um, over a one millimeter period. All right, so talking about some more specific applications, um, imaging is, again, now increasingly recognized in the United States. It is fundamental in the SKY guidelines for managing complex calcium. Um, really, before embarking on the treatment of a calcified lesion, understanding the circumference, the length, and with OCT, the thickness really changes our strategy. And here, here is a case um, where we had, had just recently where we had um, uh, worked on a right coronary total occlusion, true lumen crossing, Tried to dilate. You can see here that we are under dilated here. Again, maybe the mouse will work or maybe not. On the bottom left um, here, and you see the IVUS um, uh, rotating through and pulling back across the lesion. Well, it becomes very clear while it's non dilatable. 360 degrees of calcium, very, very um, unlikely to break. And with continued non compliant balloons, we are going to end up with a significant dissection in an underexpanded area. So you can see that right there on the bottom right. So this um, leads to um, the decision to do um, rotational atherectomy, um, which then ultimately leads to the ability to expand the solution with high-pressure non-compliant balloons, leading to an acceptable angiographic result. So critical in calcium modification, we've heard about it. We've seen a beautiful example of dealing with a very difficult problem, a protruding calcified nodule um, that was clearly visible by OCT, requiring a large burr or other techniques, such as uh, orbital or um, lithotripsy are needed, you can't get at that without actually understanding the inside of the vessel. What about detection of hematoma? So here was a case where this is an, another more complicated case of a total occlusion, successful anti-grade dissection reentry in the middle panel. There's our final outflow. What's going on with that? Is that an edge dissection? Is there no reflow? Um, what should we do with it? Should we just cover it with another stent? Well, imaging really clarified this. So on, on the right, you'll, this is a manual pullback, and what you'll see here is that um, at the um, very edge of the stent distal to it, right here you're going to see at that three to nine o'clock, this large crescent. That turned out to be a significant intramural hematoma. And so rather than trying to deal with it with another stent, which could actually propagate hematoma further, um, because of the IVUS, we were able to recognize this was an intramural hematoma, probably from the dissection reentry approach. This allowed us to use a cutting balloon. Sometimes we use the same techniques for SCAD. This allowed us to lyse the hematoma, angioplasty only, no stent with improved outflow, and this was um, really clarified by imaging. Here's another example of resolving proximal cap ambiguity. We had a flush occluded uh, mid-LED total occlusion. See a large diagonal uh, coming here, but where is the actual LED origin? Um, and so this is something that one can sometimes get at now that we're using CT more and more. We can absolutely clarify this by non-invasively by CT. In the situations where in the cath lab, um, uh, we can use IVUS. And the way that we do this is we place an IVUS in the side branch, pull back to understand where the main vessel is. And so here's an example of this um, with an IVUS coming on, on the right side. And you'll see in the upper right corner, this is the, the true vessel of the LED coming in. Not only can you understand that it's there, you can mark it with the IVUS. Um, as Dr. Lasala mentioned, you put the IVUS right at the origin, take an angiogram, you know where that IVUS is. Now that allows us to actually direct a wire under real-time guidance into the actual um, vessel. And so that's another application of IVUS is for real-time guidance. And so that's what we did here. This was a stiff wire um, being directed. And one of the nice parts is, is again, when we want to understand, do we actually cross in the true lumen or the sidewall? You can see here we're intraplaque with the IVUS. This was true lumen crossing aided by real-time IVUS um, works. 
Um, this um, uh, was then used for the more classic aspect of recognizing that we were underexpanded in this very large positively remodeled plaque in the mid LED. Even though we'd sized well to the distal lumen, we saw there was a tremendous residual plaque burden. Um, this um, informed us on how we were going to do post dilatation, where we took this initial 2 5 stent up to 3 5 and 4 0, and then did a final kiss to resolve the diagonal. So, to conclude, um, IVIS and OCT both are incredibly useful. IVIS improves outcomes in multiple randomized trials. OCT performs similar to IVIS for PCI guidance. And using intravascular imaging can provide valuable insights into multiple aspects of complex PCI. Thanks so much.